coming to you from a mysterious beacon from SETI Alpha 5. This is Politrex. The Time Directive, the Declaration of Human Rights, the United Federation of Planets, the United Nations, the World War II, the Dominion Federation War, the Art of War, the Teachings of Sirach, Jesus Christ, Welcome everyone to Politrex. Thanks for joining us while we talk all things politics within Star Trek. We're a proud member of the Tricorder Transmissions Podcast Network. My name is Barry DeFord, and here on the show, you could say he's the most reliant fellow I know, my dear friend and co-host, the often imitated, never replicated, Mr. Shashankavaru. How are you doing? Do you ever let a ship approach with its shields down, even if it was a fellow Federation ship? Namaste, homo sapiens. Barry, I am so glad you think I'm reliant. I am proud and privileged to be a part of this enterprise with you. Oh, my goodness. That was delightful. So seriously, you know, you see a ship flying in, and it's a Federation ship. Would you put your shields up anyway? Absolutely. I don't, I don't trust people. I don't, I don't just give out my, my directions and the way my life is going to go to everybody. So yeah, they, they might be a Federation ship, but you never know. It could be taken over by crazy Ferengis. And I don't want to give my money away. I've worked hard for it. <laughs> well, of course, in a, in a Trek society, you wouldn't necessarily have any money. But who knows? You might you might be selling space insurance, so you might have some Quatloos on the side, right? By the way, space insurance, I really hope, is a good uh, throwback to our Patreon conversation that you can listen to where I rant about my joys, my, my dream job of of getting to sell space insurance. It is true. You guys should probably sign up for the Patreon to hear all of our silly gaffes and stuff. It's on the Tricoder Transmissions page, sort of on the top kind of right side. And yeah, if you got a couple extra little chunks of latinum sitting around, we'd always be happy to have that. One thing I do have to say, though, about this episode, because we are going to be looking at the Politrex of the Wrath of Khan. I'm going to refuse to do the Khan scream. I just won't do it. I, I refuse to. Um... And yeah, it, do you mean you won't you won't say con? I refuse to go con. <coughs> but Barry, why won't you go con? I'd rather go con. That would have been better. I, I actually would rather go to the con happening in Vegas in oh, August. Yeah. Oh, ooh, yes, yes, yes. I want to go to the con. That would be very nice to do. So, okay, Star Trek The Wrath of Khan. Are we talking about one of the best films or the best Star Trek film? So, Star Trek The Wrath of Khan is incredible. It's visual poetry. It's one of the greatest movies ever made. People can watch The Wrath of Khan and I have seen their lives change. I see one person whose life has completely changed every time I look in the mirror. Thanks to Wrath of Khan. Who is so, that? The Wrath of that's that's me, Barry. That's I'm talking about myself because it tasks me. It tasks me, Barry. The Wrath of Khan tasks me. Ooh. And I will have that movie on Blu-ray, director's edition, for the rest of my life. I like it. So we had mentioned in an earlier podcast that uh, there's a chance you could come dressed as Ricardo Maltaban as the Wrath of Khan Khan. So we need to get you a wig. We need to get you the kind of broken uh, in uh, Enterprise Delta insignia and like the whole kind of shirt outfit and stuff like that. Um, do you think that's what possible? we absolutely? But what I think we really need is my space mind control worms, so I can take over people and I can tell uh, I can make them do my bidding because that's the dream, Barry. So last episode we talked about we talked about assimilating people and this episode we're talking about taking over their mind with space worms this this doesn't bode well they are listening to us so i would like to think we are in their ears already how how close is the brain function synapses anywhere from the ears we're like, getting there I, I would like to think we're very close yeah and and honestly to think about it in that respect um Shashank, if peop if we are earworms in that respect, how can people uh, let us know that we are their earworms? 
nice segue. People can reach out to us and tell us if they're enjoying our earworms or they would like to kill us with some space poison and take our earworm out through Polytrex. We are on at Polytrex on Twitter. That's P-O-L-I-T-R-E-K-S. And you can find us on Facebook on Polytrex where you can write us a longer message. But really follow our Twitter account because we make a lot of space jokes and a lot of political jokes and a lot of just jokes. We make a lot of jokes. We like jokes. I want to start bantering more with uh, the real Gold Cod as well. But if you guys find that you're interested in maybe leaving us a voice message too, and um, that's always a wonderful thing. We always love to hear from you. You can call into the show and leave us a voicemail at 609-512-LLAP. That's 609-512-5527. We are Politrex on the Tricorder Transmissions Podcast Network, and we're among some other really fabulous shows. Of course, Tricorder Transmissions Shore Leave, Trek Rank, Drying Trek, Reading Trek, Disco Trek, and now Trek Profiles, where yours truly is gracing the first episode. So that's pretty cool. So literally, I am on the best episode of Trek, Trek Profile so far. It's, a, it's definitely a delightful episode, but I don't know if it's going to be the best episode in the Tricorder Transmissions, because I have some pretty exciting guest appearances coming up with one of our other track shows that I'm very excited, but I can't talk about. So it's, yeah, con. <laughs> no, I, I also think that my, my, uh, my record of being the best episode of Trek profiles is going to come to a screeching halt once, um, the next guest comes on and I will leave that to John to announce, but, um, yeah, my, my reign will come to a, a very abrupt end, but that's okay. I'm, I'm happy being the only game in town right now. Speaking of abrupt ends, such a heartbreaking way to jump into the news, but Stephen Hawking passed away today. As as we record this, we, we we are a little less than a day away from having gotten that news. Yeah, there's so many feelings I have about about losing um, Professor Hawking. To be honest with you, Shashank. Um, I mean, f- I mean, first of all, the 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 contribution he made to science and the scientific community and quantum physics and our understanding of the universe and everything is is one thing so incredibly important. But I think also it hits pretty close to home, his life and his perseverance. Of course, a, a few people probably know I have a older brother who has severe cerebral palsy and epilepsy. So a very different condition than, than what Stephen Hawking had, but um, same sort of mobility issues, functional issues. My brother can't walk or talk, but um, yeah, uh, you know, having grown up with a lot of people in the disabled community, I think Stephen Hawking was was able to access a lot more um a lot more beneficial things than than other people who who may not have as high a quality of life obviously given their station but Stephen Hawking was an advocate for people with disabilities he was an advocate for for ALS and for other motor neuron diseases and he was an advocate for for health and healthcare and and everything like that so outside of his his stunning contributions to the world of physics his contributions to humanity as well need to be remembered and and lauded just as much as his scientific contributions so at 22 stephen hawking was given two years to live and this was back when medicine was still not at its highest peak of innovation there was essentially little to no chance even in stephen hawking's mind that he wasn't going to live that long but he lived to be 76 years old and he has the mantle of the smartest man in the world. I don't know if anybody in our lifetime will beat it. But just the fact that someone with so many physical and mental disabilities could make such a breakthrough in the world gives me so much hope and gives me joy and gives me reason to live and be proud to be a part of the species that he is. One of my favorite Stephen Hawking things is his concept of imaginary time. It's not originally his, but he made it very popular. And it's this fascinating idea that he posits that all time is an illusion. And because reality itself is questionable, even time does not exist and it's merely a perception. I've always wanted to write a story based on that concept. And he himself stated quite publicly many times that Science fiction writers really haven't made a lot of that one theory that he's always had. 
And I'm hoping before I pass that I can pay tribute to him in some way by getting a story published in which that concept is played with. But that's such a selfish writer's dream, a wannabe writer, writer's tirade about a great man who touched billions of lives. So we're we're just sorry and we're glad we we are glad we at least have him on TNG so we can enjoy him. Absolutely. Yeah, no, he gets he gets he gets a good little a little good little jab there, and I don't know if I could end with a little story. Um, just in regards to this, I mean, you and I, Shashank, have spoken about how much we find Stephen Hawking to be a man of comedy as well. He was a very he had a great sense of humor. Um, there's a, a story about a young lady who I grew up sort of knowing. Um, she has CP as well, cerebral palsy, but they were able to get her sort of a talking device much like Stephen Hawking's. So of course Stephen Hawking's talking device ends up being quite famous and popular kind of into the mid to late 90s as it's getting used more. And so anyway, she ends up getting trained in sort of the early 2000s and she's about 18 years old and a bit of a higher functioning cerebral palsy level than my brother, but but still, you know, mostly nonverbal and and all that sort of stuff. And so anyways, they they take her through this whole training program. She gets to to do all this extra stuff and and learns how to construct full and complete sentences where she's able to converse and all this. They have to pin one of her arms down to keep it like kind of under control so she can work the little the little um, button to select words and everything like that. And it does take her a while to get figured out. But finally, she gets to the point where she can finally say her first personally crafted sentence, right? She gets she gets to do her own sentence that she can make herself, you know, 18 years of sort of semi nonverbal communication. And finally, she gets to say her first sentence. And you know what it was? It was Please stop feeding me green beans. I hate them. <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's sort of my, my, my thing. I think Stephen Hawking would have enjoyed that, that joke. Stephen Hawking is a funny, funny man. It's a, it's, I, I would, I've really talked about this a little more on our pre-recording, but I, I've always wanted to just see a stand up set from him and it sucks that, from all the great things that he's done and that he might he could have done that's something that we'll miss because it's it just seems like a very niche thing to ask for from a scientist but he had a lot of original humor inside him and i always felt like he had at least one stand up session inside him that he could give us and grace us with but anyway i would i i would like to i'd like to think that we are better to have had him and Another really relatively smaller incident that happened in my country that seems to have intrigued Barry that he thinks has has made our country better is uh, something that was initiated by a man named Viju Krishnan, who's part of the Communist Party of India. And he recently led a farmers march, a Kisan march. Kisan is Hindi for farmers. And he led about 50,000 farmers on a march that ended with them getting a bunch of concessions and initiatives and resources that they need for better farming. Barry, why did this story move you? Well, what it, what really moves me about it is the, the farmers in India are, are, are face to face with some of the issues that, that we see with climate change, right? The, uh, India's climate is getting hotter and hotter and it's harder to farm. And I mean, India for a very long time, of course, Shashank, you know this, has has a very strong agricultural past. Uh, it also has a very strong industrial past, and that industrial past was brought to a very sudden halt by the British Empire. And, and, and I mean, that's one of the reasons why we, we see some of the famines that take place and, and whatnot is, is India's use as a colonial um, space rather than, than its own self-sufficient space. And so like with with a lot of things it's taken a long time for india to to be able to to kind of reset after that much i mean even canada has had trouble resetting from a, a commonwealth style of of existence to a more independent existence the the story of of canada's move to confederation from confederation is actually over a hundred years but that's an topic for another day. And so anyways, you know, farmers in India have had a very hard go of it. And the suicide rates among farmers is appalling. Like it's, it's, it's appalling. I don't have the exact numbers mainly because I don't know if they're being kept properly. I I don't really know. But 
more than anything, what I think is important here is farmers in this in this this part of the world are not getting the the rights that that they would that they would deserve. It's it's pay for for the work that they do. It's it's work conditions. It's being able to to have access to things that I think we as people in the West would see as a right if you were to be a farmer, right? Um, so for for a group of people and 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 Vijay Krishnan definitely deserves praise for his part in this, but I think to a degree as well. I think there's fifty thousand people who we need to be giving the thumbs up to the 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 people who who are pushing to get better better um, better you know a, a better situation from from the government um, from the landlords who who you know are involved in smuggling and it's it's causing starvation to take place. Um, all of this sort of stuff. These fifty thousand farmers march on Mumbai, which is the financial sort of hub of India, if I if I can make such a, a statement. But um, yeah, I mean, this is this is very important because this is direct action, and this is something that I believe in quite a bit. And whatever whatever ideology you find yourself at is when when the people move, when the people march you better listen. And 50,000 people, I know India has a very large population, but 50,000 is nothing to sneeze at. And that's important to me. And that's, that's a special thing. And my, my, my heart and, and my, uh, my admiration goes out to the 50,000 farmers who, who marched for their rights in direct action, saying what they want clearly and getting some concessions. I think that's super important. So a little bit of a context here. I feel like our listeners need to get a bigger picture idea of what the plight of the farmers is in our country and what the state of the Communist Party is and how this entire event is integrally tied together. Growing up, reading in our newspapers, the deaths of farmers in different places in the country was not news to us. It barely registered on the bottom section of the national page. Uh, it was it was something that almost became uh, a daily mundane piece of bad news, much like car accidents. And the graphic stories didn't even move us because we just somehow just got used to these stories to the point where they weren't even registering with us. There are so many stories of farmers committing suicides. And because they are among the poorest in our society. Really, the only way they could commit these suicides was by drinking the pesticide that they used to kill the uh, kill the beings that were killing their crops. So it's a the, there is a very gaping hole of of a community that hasn't been served well by our government. And what's and what's unusual is that this is not this is this has not been a new part of the problem of the problem that the farmers have been facing. Even my parents told me horror stories about they read uh, about even my parents told me stories that they read when they were children about how farmers were dying. And it's very endearing to see that there is such a nationwide movement now and farmers are finally being taken care of because one of the culture shocks to me, Barry, when I moved here was that I never thought that farmers could be millionaires, which seems to be the case in the in the West. People make industries out of their farms. People start companies in their farms. For me, farmers are always the poorest of the poor, always people who never got treated right, just because that's the agricultural point of view that I had. And it's also partly based on simple numbers our farmers who grew uh, we are a relatively young country our resources aren't great and our farming methods are traditional but we have a population that needs feeding our population is the second largest in the world and we are we have to rely now on pushing our farmers more and more while not being able to afford them the resources they need it's it's very delightful to see that something this big has happened and they're able to start getting the kind of treatment they deserve. It's not unlike the way veterans are treated in America. It's not unlike the way the Native Americans are treated in America, which again rings home the point where you made about 
your doubt where you stated if people are even keeping the numbers on the debts of farmers because it, you're right that there, there isn't even a good calculation happening on how how to start assessing the problem but the weird part is is that the communist party is taking initiative in my country and it's not the most popular party in in india the communist party is actually much more of a minority they're always considered to be the outliers they're considered to be antithetical to what's laid out in our constitution so the fact that viju krishnan a, a self proclaimed communist has made this happen is certainly interesting and opens a lot more ground for political change to come through from all sides but what i'm worried about is that the mass perception toward him and his party might eclipse the good that he's doing that is a fear and and there is a a grand stigma around you know the 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 meanings of it and i mean i know as well that uh, viju krishna has has maoists in his uh, in his ranks as well and and that c- can cause some people oh goodness you know mao zedong right i guess my my statement here on this is 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 there's a lot of contexts here and and to quote some star trek now context is for kings and to call someone a marxist is someone who who's going to see something critically, right? Marx was was critical of of the material um, realities within within a society and how capital is is put under control and is controlled by people who are in power. And what the point here is is the people in power are not treating the people who are feeding them very well, uh, and in fact, quite poorly. And in that respect, I think Vijay Krishnan is is sticking to his his um, ideological guns in the sense that he his his criticalness has led him to a point where there is no other way than to rise up and and demand what what I think the farmers deserve and again I hate I hate to uh, to kind of go in this direction but I really don't think that politics even even goes into this if people are dying if people are drinking pesticides. I mean, come on, this just, I mean, it should be an open and shut case that, that these individuals who are, who are growing food, who are, who are struggling to survive need to have certain, certain things given to them, right? If we can bail out banks for, for poorly managing everybody's money and, and running people into bankruptcy, surely, surely we can do stuff about, uh, about the, the people who are growing our food, who are just trying to make ends meet, just trying to work and, and make a couple bucks to keep their family alive. I guess my Star Trek connection to this is what's our prime directive? Is it non-interference? Like, do we, do we want to not interfere in something that is happening here? Because I know where this leads, right? I know where this goes. When revolutionaries, people who come up with great ideas come forward, they'd usually die, right? Mahatma Gandhi thankfully managed to get his revolution to a point where he could actually enact enough change. But I mean, he was, as, as you've told me, Shashank, he was assassinated not too long after, correct? Right. Two years after we got our independence. I rest my case uh, in that sense that my worry now is that that the head is going to they're gonna, someone's going to try to cut the head of this movement off, and that's why I'm really trying to push the idea that Vijay Krishna and I have a lot of respect for, but I have a lot of admiration for the for the perseverance and and the amount of of suffering that the that the farmers have endured, and for them to walk what was it like 150 180 miles or something like that to go to Mumbai. In, in a group of 50,000 people to demand better conditions for themselves. I mean, that's, that's so amazing. And, and, and I, I'm very proud of that. And so in that sort of sense, I think my prime directive on this is, is to bring this up, is to tell people in the West who probably would never hear of something like this. If I was part of Starfleet and I was asked what my prime directive would be to immediately get a resolution on this, I would firstly present some facts. In America, 50% of all produce is thrown away. 50% of all food that was considered fresh and ready to go into people's food mouths is thrown away. And that, if you crunch the numbers on that, in an entire year, that's one third of all food that is being thrown away. And now we have a country in which there are a billion people, but there is not enough food to go around and and to make things worse, there are farmers dying because they just don't have the resources needed to have 
a decent life, not even a millionaire's life where you can start Tyson Farms and sell your chicken, just a decent life. So for me, food equality would be my prime directive, is getting a hold of what is going on with our food situation and why can't we expedite this problem so people won't die because while they want to feed us, they're not just getting even the minimum amount of resources required to keep that fundamental need that we have fulfilled. And that breaks my heart. And that would be my prime directive is food equality. I agree. And, you know, I don't know what particularly exists for us to support this. And, you know, some people would be like, well, I'm not supporting a communist. Okay, cool. Don't don't support a communist, but but support farmers. Like, farmers are so important. I work with them every single day. I work with their kids. They are so important to us. And if they aren't, if they aren't being treated well, that is like a canary in the coal mine for me. Like, if the people making the food aren't being treated well, that says a lot. And, and I mean... This can this can go straight into uh, to to you know our supermarkets and everything like that as well, and that might be a conversation for another day. I think we need to get Manu Sadia back in here to talk to us because I think he'd have some good insights as well on uh, d- division of wealth and labor and stuff like that. But uh, perhaps we should move on to our next segment, sir. Yeah, it's uh, since we have talked about things that might keep us down. Here's some exciting news: the Dominion's falling apart. It sure is. Things are being taken away from them and the house of cards is slowly crumbling. Rex Rex Tillerson is out as Secretary of State. Yeah, and uh, crazy, uh, the the illustrious Mr. Mike Pompeo is now probably going to be uh, the new Secretary of State. So that's a fun fact. And Gal Dukat is now the head of the CIA. I mean, sorry, Gina Haspel is now the head of the CIA. Isn't that amazing? It just seems like people that we would put on logically as the worst people to to get that job or getting that job. It's like making Officer Sloan the head of Starfleet, saying Section 31 so great at killing people and calming opinions and suppressing freedom. Let's just give that guy the most important position in all of the universe for us. Let's make him head of Starfleet. Why not? And and just for the Galdacott sort of idea if you can run a secret prison in thailand and waterboard people 80 times who don't have any extra information for you and joke about it and feel like you're doing the right thing that's galdicott galdicott thought he was doing the right thing every time he did something terrible and you know trump said well you know we have our first female leader of the cia hey, you know what? I'm really glad that women are getting into good positions, but I don't care if you're a woman or a man or any of those sorts of things. If you're a monster, you're a monster. And I can't believe that this individual is being put in, in charge of, of a central intelligence agency. I am, I am appalled that this is the case. And we all know what happened when Gal Dukat ended up in a leadership position within the Dominion, how that went. So I'm really hopeful that this, you're right, that this House of Cards is starting to fall and and we can see maybe some more direct action from from the states, um, from people, from citizens who who who've had enough of this sort of stuff. Um, Card carrying Republicans who aren't happy with this. I look forward to you taking your party back because this is a mess. I don't know what will be left to take, but here's a here's just a small sliver of the sleaziness that is going around with these heads. Uh, this is just a tiny story about Mike Pompeo. The way he was elected to the House of Representatives was back in 2010, and he was representing Kansas. And the Tea Party was very big in Kansas back then. And he ran against Democrat Raj Goyal, who was the son of Hindu immigrants from India. And during this campaign that was going on between them, he posted something on his Facebook page that was, I I won't give it any value by talking about the article itself, but it was anti-Hindu. And part of it essentially, uh, it slandered people who are Hindus and immigrants. And one of the one of the things that he said in that blog article made it to the headlines because it was so appalling to read. It essentially says uh, that he and I'm I'm quoting the Al Jazeera here. He Pompeo called Goyle, his opponent 
just another turban topper we don't need in Congress or any political office that deals with the U.S. Constitution, Christianity, and the United States of America. And this guy now is the Secretary of State. And yet, for some reason, the Trump administration wants to keep telling us that they are not racist. And I guess, like, this is the thing: is this this is sort of like a like a like a level up from like the former like Lee Atwater style of of pol- pol- politicking, where you know they use race um, and and turn it into law and order, right? We would we just want safe streets when really it's we just want to arrest arrest a number of African Americans or. You know, we just want to protect marriage. Oh, no, no. We're actually just against LGBTQ rights. Um, Pompeo doesn't even bother with that. He Okay, first of all, um, as far as I understand uh, Hinduism, not many turbans get worn. That's Sikhism. And secondly, if you think about Christianity and hinduism i feel like a hindu and a christian could get along quite well because both believe in in good things and 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 are good people and and believe in good tenets and both are you know hindu cultures and christian cultures are completely functional and happy so i mean again he he's he's making an us versus them sort of thing like i I just i can't even believe that so am i i don't first of all am i right in my assumption shashank absolutely these are both both points you've made are not only correct, those are things that were said back then and they always need to be said. But why is there such why is there such blatant hypocrisy? Why do they just not accept that they're racist? Is it like a Bajoran Cardassian situation where Cardassia came to Bajor on the pretext of trade and saying, hey, we are here to just establish friendship and make things better because we have a shared history. And before you know it, they took over the planet. Why don't you, why don't you just state it outright and we'll take it from there? Because that is so much better than this hypocrisy and this lie that you seem to want to perpetuate and nobody's buying it. Well, and you know, and the Federation doesn't necessarily have the best track record here. I mean, if you think about Star Trek Insurrection with the Sona and the Baku, right? They, they almost went ahead with something horrible. And, and it was all this like kind of pretext of, well, well, we're just, you know, taking what we think is ours. And, you know, well, hey, we, we just want to protect, you know, our, our people too, kind of thing. And, and you take a group of people who, who, who are in a minority, who aren't um, here to do any harm, but then you, you kind of place these these paradigms upon them to vilify and separate. And, and I just think to myself, you know, the amount of immigrants who I know who've moved to Canada are all hardworking, wonderful people. And, and I just, I mean, I've met my fair share of poo heads, but it, it doesn't matter who you are, or where you are. I mean, it's a personality thing. It has nothing to do with your racial background. Um, and I've met a lot of wonderful people. And, and I, I will say that like, I have a pretty high track record of meeting awesome people from other countries of other religions and other backgrounds who have influenced me in a positive way. Um, well, you're welcome, Barry. Well, yeah, exactly. And you're welcome too, because I'm from another country as well. Um, which is funny. I mean, I don't know, Canada and the United States have a lot in common and, and stuff like that. And we're definitely the West, I guess you could say, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know why the pretext still exists, and and it is the joke isn't funny anymore. You're absolutely right. So I don't know. We've we I've had a couple uh, people mention they're like, oh, your news segments are dreary. It's like, okay, cool. Um, these are important, and I, we're we're a political podcast, so I won't make excuses. I enjoy talking about this stuff, and even though it's it's in a negative sense, we hope that uh, we hope that you can turn this into a dialogue with us online. Hey, if you disagree with us, you think Mike Pompeo is the best choice for the CIA? Tell me why. Convince me. Right? Pop tarts are are ravioli, and Pompeo is probably the worst choice for Secretary of State, and. Gina Haspel is the worst person to be in charge of a Wendy's, let alone the CIA. If there is a bit of good news that I can share in this whole House of Cards chaos that's happening, it's that Alan Lichtman, the professor who has been predicting American elections correctly for the last 30 years, who, by the way, also just on a side note, predicted that Trump would win, and he was right essentially putting the benchmark on predictions of where things will go in politics 
has made a bold new prediction saying, guess what's going to happen? Before 2020, Trump will be impeached. So if all his predictions have come true, including the one that none of us saw coming or most of us didn't see coming, then we can only hope that this happens. And things are things are going to be interesting. We certainly live in interesting times. And what else is interesting, perhaps one of the most interesting things and something that I love and is visual poetry and incredible and one of the greatest movies ever made is The Wrath of Khan. Let's get to our main topic, Shashank. So excited. Tasks me. He tasks me and I shall have him. I'll chase him around the moons of Nibia, drown the Antares maelstrom, drown perdition's flames before I give him up. The sound of a delightful Hyderabad accent for an Indian character sounds pretty awesome. And I think we're going to get into that a little bit further later. But first of all, I mean, really, The Wrath of Khan is about revenge, isn't it? The movie is, uh, it's a Shakespearean political story to me. It seems if you replace all the sci-fi with medieval European tropes, that movie speaks like something that you would you would hauntingly tell a story about when you talk about politics. It's so ancient Greek, it's so ancient Roman, and the movie has so much tragedy and revenge and people being wronged at the center of it. It almost feels a lot, a lot like the the movie was trying to be futuristic by going back to history. I like that idea of being futuristic by by going back and and I think you know one thing that has always sort of made me think about it is that moment on the Reliant when when Khan points and he sees the Enterprise and it feels very much like Captain Ahab and Moby Dick, right? Seeing the whale, seeing the white whale, and finally getting his opportunity. Um, of course, the greatest quote, I think, of all is, you know, revenge is a dish best served cold. And I really feel that, you know, in that icy hostility in the coldest depths of space, Khan truly does, for a moment, taste what revenge would look like. And I often used to wonder to myself, you know, in terms of re- revenge politics, the black and white of it, what happens after? You know, imagine he succeeded and, and we watch the Enterprise get destroyed. We watch Kirk die. What do you think Khan would have done after? I think he would have just you know, like gone to a, like a, I don't know, and, uh, um, uh, like some diner on Aldebaran and like had a soda? Like, I don't know. What, what do you think? Uh, before I answer that question, it's interesting that you bring up Moby Dick because the quote I read from is actually a paraphrase of a line from Moby Dick. He tasks me is an actual quote from Moby Dick. So that's incredible that he brought that up. That's very poetic. But to answer your question, I feel very much like if Khan had succeeded, he would go full space punisher. He would take more ships. He would essentially wage a one-man crusade based on revenge and the wronging of his people and would not stop until he annihilated everyone that had ever wronged him and everyone that stands in his way. That feels like what he would do, which is not unlike the political motivations of some of the more extremist leaders at the time. You have Cuban leaders who had very romantically talked about during that time at the height of the Cold War, how they're they're seeing beauty in annihilation, how they're seeing beauty in destruction. And a lot of the members in the Warsaw Pact in that time, in hushed circles, talked about how these countries romanticize the destruction of places in the world. And a lot of the danger, the nuclear danger, comes from the fact that there was this romantic view of destroying people that you feel have wronged you, which seems like an exact scene from real life taken in and put into the character traits of Khan. You know, speaking of, of you know, talking about the Castro regime specifically, you know, there was that point where when Castro 
spoke of how this was all going to be coming out in the wash um, when he was fighting Batista, he of course did mention at one point, history will absolve me. And the idea that, you know, in, in time, the wrongs that I've had to do will ultimately show that I was in the right. And yeah, I do think that, that to some degree, the, um, the 25th of July movement that, uh, that moves forward. It might've been the 26th of July movement. I'm suddenly having a, uh, a brain fart, but, um, the, the Castro's movement that starts in the Sierra Maestra and the Southern tip of the Island, moving its way all the way up to Santa Clara, you see a, a group who is to a degree, I think, bent on revenge and the way the Batista regime treated the Cuban people for such a long period of time, you know, were they justified in, in how they acted and how they, how they moved and, and, and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, that's an interesting way of looking at it and, and a, a very particularly, um, partially concerning thing to look at as well, I think. That's the beauty of this movie also, because on a, on a political and social context, Khan is a space dictator. He's space evil Che Guevara. He's space extremist Castro. He's space Trump. 20 years removed from now where he has taken over the world and is ready to go on to aliens because all aliens are bad. You could almost replace Khan's character with most of uh, tyrants from history and some of our political leaders today. And the movie would be just as powerful because that, that revenge and the need to get back at someone, especially by taking over people, by using people as cannons, by using humanity as fodder seems like a like the traditional evil politician that we have come to know today so you mentioned che Guevara, and um not yet but i'm going to disagree with you that um you know you say he's evil che Guevara. i would say that um maybe but i think evil che Guevara would just be a terrible dictator um and i want to talk about che a little more when we talk about sacrifice as well um and if I offend anybody by maybe putting Shay in a positive light, it's a political podcast. So let's let's talk. Anyways, let's get back a little bit to this sort of idea of revenge in politics. Um, I often think of probably the most modern form of revenge politics would have been the justified, and that's a good question, the justified attack in Afghanistan and in Iraq after September 11th. I wanted to see the Taliban fall after I saw those towers fall. I was upset. I was sad. Um, that was an attack on us. Um, and when I say us, I mean Western society and and stuff like that. And, and I remember being personally happy that, that you know, this, this was happening, that we were going to go and, and, and erase a regime uh, that we saw as inherently evil. Um, I also think that to a degree, looking at the attack on Iraq was very much the son finishing the father's job. And there's something sort of revengey about that as well. Um, I don't know. What do you think about that, Shashank? The idea of you saying that the Taliban is an allegory here, that that is a reference point, is very interesting because this movie is also so much about context. And from the context of the Middle East, there are people who have talked about how the Taliban is their good guys. For them, they did, they were good guys who were morally upstanding that did something wrong. And in, in this movie, you'll see that come full circle when Khan's followers follow him to the bitter end because they believe he's doing the right thing, even though he's clearly on a path of evil and domination and he's he's going down a path that will not lead to anything good he they all believe in his cause so much and they've been personally wronged so badly that they do not see that there is a line that needs to be drawn so when convinced of sheer rightness i find that there's always this nature of of battle that takes place after that right when you uh, when you think of the idea that you know you're saying that the taliban see themselves as correct. And so they will use any means necessary. And in their case, using guerrilla warfare as a successful means with which to fight and take out their their enemy. Um, that's an interesting thought. I mean, obviously in Cuba, um, the Cuban revolutionaries do that. In the Sierra Maestra, I would say that the Vietnamese do that in the Vietnam War. And I mean, even to a degree, you see a back and forth style of guerrilla fighting 
you know, it usually kind of breaks down into guerrilla fighting in both the Korean War and specifically in Guadalcanal between the Japanese and the Americans. So it's fascinating, especially when you seem to be convinced of your correctness, you're willing to go down some pretty, uh, some pretty crazy paths in terms of fighting to get your aim. Just to take from that and add it to something that hits home for me, when when you're a child in India and you're studying Indian history, there is a very divided figure who also succeeded mostly during the Indian freedom movement on guerrilla tactics. His name was Bhagat Singh, and he was executed at 23 years because he was leading a movement that had become very extremist to get rid of the British at the time. And he was very famously at odds with Mahatma Gandhi, who was on a non-violent path. And they were both at loggerheads. And even on the hour of his execution, Mahatma Gandhi had the opportunity to just make a phone call and tell him, even though this person is using violent tactics, you shouldn't kill him because he's fighting for the right cause. But he didn't. And Bhagat Singh got executed, which only angered people more because in spite of his violent tactics, one of his most popular uh, violent tactics was he actually bombed the Indian parliament building. And if you actually go to the Delhi parliament building today, they'll show you the site where Bhagat Singh and two of his comrades walked in during the British Indian government session, uh, during a British Indian government session and caused a violent attack. They bombed that place and then they tried to escape. Uh, but this idea of freedom and getting the right thing done using violent means is intricate to guerrilla warfare. And that's no different from a freedom fighter in my time, from stories about the freedom movements in America, in Canada, in the West, to this space opera story and that i find deeply endearing about the movie that it touches it does it takes that risk by showing you a villain who is using something that people over our history have done so many countless times and that's why i think khan also succeeds mostly as a villain he does and and his success as a villain is in that ambiguity i think because he he is ultimately convinced that he is protecting the, the people who he feels have been wronged. And, you know, I mean, even all the way back into Space Seed, he is, a, he is megalomaniacal, right? He is very much convinced of his own perfection. And that is, I think, his downfall. If he was purely protecting his people, if he was purely protecting a group of people who deserved a part in Federation society, that I think is where we see our big difference and maybe where we see the, the violence and the villainy come out so much greater, right? So you're talking about um, um, Singh and, and yeah, I think that's the thing is I don't think if Singh was to have, to have won or to have defeated his enemies in, in that sort of way, do you think he would have been violent afterward? I do not think when you've gone that far, there is turning back. Whether you look at examples from history, whether you try to look at other sci-fi examples, when you've drawn, when you've crossed over the line and you're ready to hurt people to to get the right thing done, that I don't think that is something you ever come back from. And that is true for Khan. That is true for a lot of our extremist revolutionaries that were executed, that were slain in public because the their ideas weren't wrong, their goals weren't wrong. It was the way they tried to get to that is is what hurt them the most. But isn't that also then the state in that respect also utilizing the exact same violence for its peaceful means? I mean, I, I, I can't not talk about the Black Panthers, right? They did use violent means. And I mean, their movement wasn't in reaction to what would ultimately become the executions of both Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr., one of whom is peaceful and one of whom did use violent tactics. If you look at the Black Panther Party, they also exercised both. They would follow the police around in uh, as, as armed civilians, exercising their Second Amendment rights in California. They would also host be- breakfast programs and make sure that the the kids in the street were were being fed and and being nourished and whatnot. And then you see the violent, violent reaction from the state to subdue and quiet them. And so I often wonder, you know, 
violence being something used by a person who's looking for a better shake for their people is being violently stopped by the state that is currently going to keep up whatever status quo exists. The Black Panther movement is a great example. And the deeper you look into it, the deeper you realize that there, there is a lot of gray area there. And you don't even have to go that deep to understand this concept. Just look at the post-Arab Spring movements that have been backed by the West. While the West and the governments of our democratic nations tout guerrilla warfare from our our opposition is bad. One of the greatest triumphs of the post-Arab Spring movements is the fact that a lot of the troops are backed by Western nations. Famously, most recently, there are a lot of triumphs in Syria and there are a lot of uh, ISIS-occupied areas taken back from them by the Iraqis because there were US-backed troops. There was famously the discussion of boots on the ground uh, politics and boots on the ground warfare. And that to me is just guerrilla warfare in hiding. You take a powerful group of people that are technically equipped and you beat them using the element of surprise and using the element of little technology that you have. And in the process, you're using stealth and hiding to your advantage. And that also plays greatly in the wrath of Khan. Throughout the movie, Khan and his followers use guerrilla warfare tactics. They take over vessels, they take over the minds of people. And throughout the movie, it is trying to apparently tell you that that is bad. But in the end, success comes from Star Street by also using some of these familiar, similar guerrilla warfare tactics. So it's really difficult to decide which one's right and wrong, mainly also because Khan is such a good villain and Ricardo Montalban plays him so well, you you have trouble deciding who's the good guy and who's the bad guy, in, even though you can clearly tell, oh yeah, that is bad. And oh yeah, Star Street is good. You know, and I think that's where we have to really consider the, the 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 intentions of both sides, right? Like Kirk can have sort of almost megalomaniacal tendencies sometimes throughout his career as a Starfleet officer. I mean, in the last episode, we talked about how he basically just pinballed Decker right out of the spaceship until Decker was like, well, I guess I'm just going to unite with an artificial intelligence and peace out of the whole thing. But um, maybe maybe kind of seeing where that line is drawn, right? I think Kirk is very much devoted to his, his crew, and he's devoted to the people he has spent so much time with. Whereas I think ultimately what Khan is, is he is devoted to himself. He is devoted to his idea and his ideal. And though he loves the crew that he has, I think ultimately he sees them as a avatar or a, a manifestation of himself as, as part of that greater society that he wants to create, not for the betterment of mankind, but for the betterment of his personal cause. Whereas I think that's where we see the difference in Kirk and ultimately in the sacrifice of Spock, where where Spock realizes that he can he can save everything by sacrificing himself. Whereas in Khan, he sacrifices everything to keep his point as solid as possible. I mean, he could have raised the white flag and I think Starfleet would have probably punished him and his crew, but they wouldn't have killed him. And I think this is also a great time to just talk about the portrayal of Khan, the using of the name Khan Noni and Singh, which is a clearly a South Asian Punjabi name, and the portrayal of a Mexican actor as an as an Indian character. That that is disappointing to me to say the least, especially because Star Trek is such a progressive franchise. I agree. I just want to get this out right now. I think recalled Ricardo Maltaban is one of the most amazing actors to grace Star Trek. And this is in no way a critique against him as a human being. I think he is very much in that a product of what was happening politically and socially during the, well, what started in the late 60s with Space Seed all the way up until I think we see the last vestige of that taking place in and around the 80s. And since then, it has been finding actors of you know, ethnic descent, playing actors of similar ethnic descent, with odd exceptions from time to time that have been, I think, pretty much panned. Like, I mean, you think about the modern Ghost in the Shell movie, right? That uh, that didn't that didn't go over terribly well. Um, <laughs> you know, I think I think there is a lot to be said about characterizing groups properly. 
But I think, yeah, the 60s was wrought with that. I mean, you look at most Westerns and uh, Native Americans were portrayed by white men in kind of brown face, like they they just have shoe polish on their face. And you can even take it as far back to the racist trope movie um, Birth of a Nation, where a clearly white man is just in blackface acting like a total piece of garbage. And first of all, he's he's characterizing an entire group of of Americans in a horrifyingly terrible way. And that was the purpose of the movie. Um, And it's getting it wrong on so many levels. So I don't know, personally, I kind of liked your your quote at the beginning, Shashank, because we heard Khan spoken with an Indian accent, which I think is what it originally deserved. Revenge is a dish best served in a podcast. It's definitely, it's definitely intriguing to me the idea that they they decided to go with a Mexican actor, because it's even if you go back to the original series, you can actually see Indian and South Asian actors in the background. There are a lot of red shirts that you can see in the background, and you can tell that Gene Roddenberry went through painstaking measures just to get every representation out there. And famously, George Takai has told this story multiple times. He before the start of the first episode, called the entire cast together and told them how they were all representing the world, how they were all representing each of the ethnicity, ethnicities and the genders that they belong to. And when they went that far, it sucks that the politics of Hollywood got in his way. And in a lot of ways, this also belongs in the conversation that we are having today regarding the polytrex of the Wrath of Khan, because the way the movie was made, it was made at a time when investment in a South Asian actor would have been the last thing anybody would have thought about. It was being made at a time when Almost all characters that, in spite of clearly being written or bought out to life by people from another time and another place, were being played by white actors. So the fact that Star Trek missed the opportunity to use an Indian character or a South Asian character actor to show a character from that place, that that breaks my heart. Because The Wrath of Khan is one of the best movies ever made, period. Ricardo Maltaban is incredible. He's one of the great villains. But why couldn't they have gone just uh, just one step further and actually hired someone that looked like me so we could have had that representation, even as an evil character, because that character was born in that place and comes from that time. That That seemed like such a missed opportunity in Star Trek to me. And, you know, I mean, it's always going to kind of be a bit of a knot in the rug because there is that 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 paradox of, well, if we had an Indian actor, they would have characterized it differently from Ricardo Montalban, who in a lot of cases stole the show. But I guess, you know, we're looking at it through such a different lens now. But I think it's something that it deserves conversation and it merits good conversation on this. And if anything, this can spur us forward into what type of cinema we want to see in the future, because talent is everywhere. And when we characterize that talent properly, I think that's what's very, very important. And if I was if I was to, to venture you know, where this took us, I think it does end up moving us forward into actors portraying themselves. You know, you and I had spoken a little bit about the 2009 Star Trek. Uh, in the future, of course, we have an Indian captain who, who I think does have a lot of strength. Unfortunately, he doesn't get a lot of screen time, but he was pretty awesome. Also, of course, in um, would have been the voyage home, we get an Indian actor um, whose ship gets knocked out by the gigantic space sausage squeaker whale. <laughs> you know. uh, and and not to forget Ash in Star Trek Discovery. Absolutely. We have we have a solid, solid showing there of a of a fantastic, fantastic portrayal. And and again, you know, I think to a degree, all the way when we get up to Ash, there isn't really a lot that gets um put of sort of like I am from, you know, South Asian descent coming from uh Shazad Latif. But uh Definitely, it's nice to see him portrayed. And that's the cool thing about Shrek is the representation of a particular character is not made a big deal of. And it shows you how that is normal. And it subconsciously makes you question, why do I feel like that character should have been another ethnicity? And when Trek succeeds mostly and it failed in this one moment, that broke my heart the first time I saw this movie and the first time I saw Space Seed because... uh, it clearly looked like a character who was supposed to come from that place. And then it looked like someone who was not that. And it it's, it that just uh, broke my heart. But 
I understand that the politics of Hollywood at that time were different. The politics of selling a movie and getting that movie made, especially after the motion picture did not do the business it should have done for Paramount. I I understand where the director and the writers and the creatives behind the movie came from. And I don't think that is a risk that they would have been allowed to take at that time. No, I think you're right. And the politics of Hollywood hasn't ended. I mean, obviously, you and I spent several of our previous news segments talking about what's happened to women within the uh, within Hollywood community. I mean, it seems like sometimes when we take a few steps forward, we're taking a few steps back. Just recently, I heard about Quentin Tarantino apparently wasn't very kind to Uma Thurman during the uh, the filming of Kill Bill, which of course has a strong female a uh, strong female lead who in fact quotes Star Trek The Wrath of Khan right at the beginning. Um, but, you know, it, it's funny how sh- she is playing the strong woman who's getting revenge for being wronged. And it sounds like, especially speaking again of Mexico, she was driving in a car she was not comfortable doing. She said she didn't want to do it. She basically kind of got browbeaten and guilted and f- you know, sort of verbally forced by Tarantino to drive this dangerous car on a dangerous road. And lo and behold, she crashed it and got quite hurt. And there's a camera there, you see her, and she kind of passes out for a minute. And it's really disturbing to see. But um, yeah, the politics of Hollywood is something that uh, I'm personally happy I'm not, uh, I'm not a part of. Obviously, I'd have it easier because I am a white anglo-saxon heterosexual male but um to be aware of it would would really suck and now i think is a good time to go into one of my favorite things about this movie and that is the discussion of the political and social context of genesis the idea of genesis the plot device used in this movie and before i get into my long discussion just in case you guys haven't figured it out talking about this movie is one of the most exciting things i get to do on this podcast for the foreseeable future so i'll try to let barry slip in his thoughts so i don't overtake all of it so barry what did you think of genesis and the social and political context of of that idea well genesis is for me technology writ into a movie right it it has the power to create and it has the power to destroy And within those creation and destruction moments, we always see the balance in between, right? We could, in essence, completely destroy all life on Earth with this weapon, but we could also seed a planet that has no life on it with it. Um, And that's not to say that the life on Earth would be destroyed. It's just basically it's like hitting a gigantic reset button and starting all over again. So I found the Genesis device to be, you know, kind of the, the, the... analogy of so many different technologies that we possess now they can be such such forces of good and they can also be such forces of evil genesis to me the first time i saw the movie was genetic editing it was cloning it was genetic reconfiguration it was everything we were having conversations about back in the early and late 2000s that have come one step closer to reality now famously dolly the sheep was cloned in the late 90s and cloning had come leaps and bounds ahead of its time in the years that followed and Genesis, the idea in that movie, also was prophetic when it claimed that that would be something that we would want to do. So at this point, in where we are as as a species, is that we have not only realized we can create and duplicate life, we can essentially reorganize all life in one particular location. And there are so many politics that goes in go into that. Famously, there are a lot of countries today, India included, that have banned human cloning, which is weird because most countries use cloning of cells cells, embryos, and parts of the body to help you heal, to to, uh, help with surgery, to help uh, eradicate some of your health issues. When countries are open to innovations in cloning of and genetic reconfiguration of cells at the molecular level, it just seems like the next logical step to reconfigure and edit human beings altogether. Anyway, point being, in this movie, there is such a beautiful duality that you might have missed when you saw Star Trek to the Wrath of Khan. Uh, the movie mainly revolves around Genesis, and it's 
potential success or failure. And Genesis is a project of genetic reconfiguration. And Khan, the villain, is a genetically reconfigured superhuman. And it's another one of those things that the movie does where it shows you how beautiful and promising at its beginning human tampering of nature can be and how, if it goes wrong, how evil and monstrous and almost haunting and destructive genetic reconfiguration of human beings could be the the fact that it took that one idea that one seed and it completely twisted it on its head by showing it as a villain is another reason why this movie is so incredible to me there is a lot that you have said in there that makes me wish i had watched the movie more and had and and you and i could have even sat down and uh, and put together more because there's so much that i want to respond to but uh I don't know. There's so much there. I, I, when I edit this, I'm going to be like thinking a lot. So again, well done. That's, that's a neat, neat sort of duality that you've, that you've brought forward that I hadn't thought of enough. You know, the idea that, that Khan himself is, is a genetic reconfiguration and, and look at what could happen, right? When, when we start really focusing on that genetic reconfiguration, I mean, if you think about the Star Trek history, you know, he takes over the most of the world, right? He's a despotic ruler, a terrible person who, who enslaves millions, billions of people. And it's because of the, these eugenic wars that, that sort of take place that ruin us in a long, in a lot of the ways and, and maybe under, make, make us understand that, you know, we don't necessarily have to be perfect. And maybe it's in that imperfection that we find our humanity, because if we keep seeking perfection, we will ultimately destroy ourselves, just like Khan ends up actually doing to himself. And another uh, idea of that science and politics part is portrayed so well in the movie, because the characters are uh, are constantly opposed to being taken over by by nature as an idea some characters believe that their species is better than the other species because they have taken control of the situation and how they're better at something and genesis overall is an idea of controlling everything and redoing everything and con- Uh, essentially navigating how life should go. That also comes physically to a head in the movie when Khan takes over uh, two people in the crew, one of of my favorite characters, Chekhov included, using a mind control life form that allows him to navigate the way people act. Uh, And that's just another one of those little plot points in that movie that that just screams poetry to me. Yeah, he the the control of one's mind, I think, especially is is an insidious sort of thing. And and I guess more than anything, when you really put together what Khan's whole purpose in the movie is, is to show that within the you know within the 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 seeking of perfection, you you find actually a lot of illogic. Right? It's not a logical thing. It's not. It's not something that's going to lend itself to sustainability. And like you said, you know, when I asked, you know, will Khan just go and have a soda on Aldebaran after this, if he was to have succeeded, you're like, no, he would have just kept going and he would have kept, you know, flashing out at, at different, different things that he saw as inferior or part of his revenge narrative. And, and you, you start to see that, that it, it is such an incredibly huge illogical thing that will will consume you completely. And, you know, when you think about what, what Khan's purpose is in this, his purpose is to show how much of a folly there is in seeking genetic perfection, or even if we're looking for perfection or, or trying to control things that really might just be outside of our purview. The movie then also very cleverly takes Khan the idea and almost makes it bigger than the movie. Like just look at our podcast today. We have spent over half our time talking about Khan and his idea and guerrilla warfare and using science as a weapon of good and evil that we've forgotten that one of the most important events in the history of Star Trek happens in this movie. And that is the death of Spock. Yes. And that is where I'm going to take a moment here. And uh, probably offend a ton of you. Um, so we'd mentioned Che Guevara earlier, and sort of the idea of of the revolutionary or or whatnot. Che Guevara ends up 
um, getting killed in Bolivia in the uh, late 1960s, I believe it was in 1967, where he's captured by CIA-funded uh, troops who catch him and they take him, he's in an airfield. And there, the story goes that he walks, um, or sorry, he, he's locked, he's locked in uh, this, this little kind of holding room, and a soldier is ordered to go and kill him. So the soldier walks in and there is the mighty Che Guevara, you know, obviously mighty good or mighty bad that's i'll leave that to the audience to to choose but apparently shay's last words were shoot coward you're only killing a man and i think about that and the idea of what was more important to che in that respect it was the movement it was it was the revolution itself the individual did not matter and i think that's a really interesting point because when Spock is left with the choice to end his own life and save everybody or go down with everybody or maybe evacuate or allow Khan to succeed in some way, shape, or form, it's clear. It's clear that, that, that the death of a man, being Spock in this case, is immaterial to the life and the ideals that he espouses. And that's something that I've always thought is really important to understand. So whether you like or dislike Che Guevara, I think his his ideals put him in that category of someone who is not concerned with the good of themselves. They're much more concerned with the good of the many. The the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one is one of the most famous Star Trek quotes. And it comes from Spock. And it, com- it comes to a head in this movie, not just as a quote, but as an idea. Because you see Spock following up on that quote full circle. And then you see the exact opposite of that quote, where Khan utilizes people. And he outweighs everybody else's needs just to fulfill his one need for revenge and to get back at Kirk. There is another beautiful duality that is shown that to me screams politics, that screams the idea of a politician. If you just think about it, a politician is there to help people, plain and simple. You You hire a politician, you vote a politician in so he can get the needs of the people together and help people decide what's best for them and do that for them. But so much of the identity of these things and what these things mean and where that politician stands for on those particular ideas is defined by the politician himself. Uh, There's a reason why a lot of us say the Obama era, the Kennedy era, the Trump era, the, the fact that we term those names and essentially give that one person's last name the identity of all those things, in spite of that person being there to fulfill our needs, to fulfill the needs of the many, and put their own identity aside, is beautifully shown in that movie. And it, it's that's why the movie is not just a good revenge epic. It's not just a good Shakespearean epic. It's a, it, it's a really good take on modern politics. Well, I mean, to, to, to really bring that down into microcosm, if you think about a good Star Trek crew, right? When you think about the crew of the original Enterprise, it's the crew, right? Yes, there are some larger-than-life characters within that crew, but it's the crew. It's the group. It's it's them kind of idea. Um, it's a uh, it's looking at the Next Generation crew, even Voyager, Deep Space Nine, and and the development of Discovery's crew as well. You know, um, the, and there's a bit of a development in that sense with Enterprise as well. One thing I will bring is I'm going to bring in my almost patented Canadian um, connection here. So I come from Edmonton, Alberta, which is the the hockey home, not the actual home, but the hockey home of Wayne Gretzky the statistically the greatest hockey player of all time so far and he won several stanley cups for the edmonton oilers that team and and it did sort of end up that he kind of became almost larger than life well of course eventually wayne gretzky has to move on edmonton can't pay him as much as some of the other teams so he goes on to los angeles goes in place for the los angeles kings for a long time and continues an amazing career all the way to the very end But there's something really interesting that takes place uh, in 1990, 1991, and that is where the Oilers win the Stanley Cup again without Wayne Gretzky. And that makes me just really think toward the idea that it is about the crew, it's about the people together that make that strong 
thing and and the needs of the one right the or even the influence of the one isn't as important as the influence of the team and so i think that for me is a very high watermark for what teamwork looks like and i think that gets embodied very well within star trek and again you and i kind of looping that back to khan it's about khan and that's why he fails whereas though of course we see later that Spock's death isn't really a full-on death. Spoiler alert. Um, he, it doesn't matter because people had to wait a number of years to find out whether or not Spock was really, really gone. And they had to sit on that. They had to think about that. They had to think about what that sacrifice meant. And I would say that losing a member of that crew doesn't diminish the crew. It actually shows just how strong they are if one is willing to sacrifice him or herself for that greater good. It's also interesting that the idea of revenge shows Kirk as a good guy in the in the movie. Even though unintentionally, Kirk also mirrors the acts that Khan is doing instead of submitting to the idea that there might be better people equipped to handle the situation, Kirk doubles down. And when he's cornered, instead of asking for help, he decides he will do what is right for him. And he'll decide, uh, and his idea of him is so intricately tied with the idea of uh, Starfleet that he decides I will go and wage this one man war against this guy who's trying to get his revenge on me. And it shows how even with good intentions, you can unintentionally do some of the things that your enemy is doing. And that is so much a political allegory for most of the wars that have taken place in modern history. Uh, you, The U.S.-Iraq War, uh, the Vietnam War, World War II, you can see how people use a, a same idea, the idea of I am going to do the right thing in such different ways. And even Kirk is also a victim to that. And the victimization comes full circle when he sees his best friend die. I agree. And and I think in, in that sense, victory is always couched in mitigating circumstances. And if we don't appreciate the idea that, that victory comes from those mitigating circumstances, then we are all just sort of con, right? We There is no such thing as absolute victory. There can never be. I would uh, actually encourage everybody at this point, there's a fantastic book written, written by Greg Graffin. Uh, you may know him as the lead singer of the punk band Bad Religion. He also has a several degrees with a doctorate in zoology, and he has a book called Population Wars. And it's something that I think that we at Politrex will probably want to talk about somewhere in the future and, and talk about the idea that really no victory is absolute even in nature. And if we can accept that, we can be better managers and stewards of the relationships that we hold instead of trying to seek ultimate victory against one another. And I think in a lot of cases, what we see right now in terms of the conflicts we have, there's a lot that we carry around in our backpack that we want revenge for. And there's a lot that we carry around that we hate and we dislike and that we want to see made better, quote unquote. And maybe in that respect, you see, you know, the elements, the internal elements of a megalomaniacal mindset of saying that, well, if I just do this, then I will make this, you know, the greatest thing ever. And that's not possible. You know, you are always going to have conflicting views. You're always going to have conflict. People are going to do things that are wrong to each other. And sometimes revenge isn't the best dish served warm, cold, tepid, or, you know, on spaghetti, whatever it, it <laughs> revenge is just not, is just not anything that's going to help you. And in the movie Kill Bill as well as mentioned, and I believe it's a proverb possibly from Japan where it says that revenge is a forest and it truly is. And it's so easy to get lost. Uh, I believe one of the most famous Confucius quotes also is a man on a quest for revenge must ultimately dig two graves, one for the person he has taken his revenge on and one for himself. Because when you go down that route, there is a very thin line between Saddam Hussein and George W. Bush, especially during that that era, that early 2000s to mid 2000s era that we all grew up around and remember all too well. It's the the terror that was caused by using the system and the terror that was caused using the idea that what we are doing is right and using violent extremist means to achieve that cause. Anyway, speaking of the consequences of this revenge, 
I think this would be a good time to just talk about self-sacrifice. What do you think, Barry? Sure. Yeah, we'll finish off there, I think. We're already 50 minutes into this fabulous conversation. And uh, folks at home, I hope you're enjoying it as much as we're enjoying it. And I would really encourage uh, letting us know what you think about some of these points that we're making. So finally, self-sacrifice. Um, this is something that's kind of near and dear to my heart, and it's something that I have talked about before. Um, a good leader will know will know that that they are not the most important thing. A good person in a community will know that they are merely a piece of, of what is a greater group. And to be able to give yourself to someone else or to a cause or to something that you see is, is good and, and, it, and it shows a positive outcome, I think that is that is probably one of the greatest things a human being can do. I think of a tale of two cities, right? Where someone actually takes the place of another person um, in an execution because they love them. I also think though that self-sacrifice can also be one of the most selfish things. So it is all couched in how the person does their self-sacrifice. If you are someone who is planning to cause death and destruction and ultimately hurt the innocent, well, then maybe you should rethink that. I mean, obviously I'm reducing quite a bit of information here, but, um, you know, self-sacrifice in, in the case of Spock is, is probably one of the most admirable things. But obviously when we think about suicide bombings, uh, kamikaze pilots, stuff like that, you see where self-sacrifice is actually quite selfish. Absolutely. And I don't know if you're doing this intentionally, Barry, but I love the poetry that you're bringing about because you just quoted Tale of Two Cities. And a Tale of Two Cities is a birthday gift that Spock gives to our uh, Captain Kirk. It's uh, in the Wrath of Khan. I, I love that you know, unintentionally or intentionally we are joining all these little things together, just like the movie does. Because even the self-sacrifice idea, there is that duality. There is the duality of showing Spock and his death being so heartbreaking. And then the self-sacrifice of Khan and the self-sacrifice of his followers is shown in such an evil portrayal. Even though if you just look at it from a logical human perspective, these are people who are who they believe are martyrs on both ends. And the movie pushes for the idea that what Spock does to save his crew is a harder thing to do and the right thing to do, while what Khan does and his followers do, in spite of them having the exact same idea of the protection of what they think is right, is evil and not to be something that is followed romantically. And that is where uh, you're absolutely right. Suicide bombers are a, are a great example to show that duality. Uh, famously in India, Mahatma Gandhi is considered our, our country's greatest martyr because he was assassinated shortly after independence. And when you take that, when you take that idea of Mahatma Gandhi and self-sacrifice and you compare it to the political leader I was telling about, Bhagat Singh, there is a significant group of our population that consider him to be an extremist, while there is a significant group of our population, me included, that thinks that his self-sacrifice was just as important to save our country's soul and to bring freedom to India as Mahatma Gandhi's was. Not discounting either, it's important to remember that even self-sacrifice is used so well in politics as a perspective, and there is no clear-cut right and wrong. Yeah, um, obviously, I've I've evoked several historical figures myself and, and their sacrifice as well. Though some of these figures are, are maligned or flawed, it is important to consider their sacrifice, especially when it's writ large. So I think my two big, you know, people who, who might be conflicting in that respect would be Malcolm X and Che Guevara. Both of these individuals did use violence and can be thought sometimes to have gone in directions that others may find, you know, uh, offensive or, or they disliked. But uh, I think that their sacrifice is part of their legend and it's part of who they are and it's part of their legacy that we end up seeing. And so I think Spock is a lot more clear cut in terms of who he is and, and what he's doing. But, you know, um, yes, I, 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 of course, obviously, the Tale of Two Cities does fa factor heavily. And I also think that um, when we think about Kirk getting his Enterprise back, it truly was the best of times and the worst of times, wasn't it? That's a great way to tie this 
episode up in a neat little bow, but before I let you get to final thoughts on this, I just want to, if nobody has figured it out yet, I love this movie. Uh, the Wrath of Khan is my second favorite Star Trek movie. It's one of the best movies ever made. It's one of the best political movies ever made. And even with its flaws, especially in the representation of an actor that is personal to me, I will never ever look at a villain in the way I look at Ricardo Maltaban. And I don't think any villain in history will be as powerful and, and as impactful as Khan in that movie. So I hope from my end and from Barry's end, we have helped you look at some deeper meanings in this movie. I certainly have watched it so many times. Every time I see it, I realize I found something new. And that's because this movie continues to surprise me and helps me discover things about life and humanity every time I watch it. It's hard to believe that's, that it's it's such an old movie because this could be taken 100, 200, 300 years into our future and still would be just as relevant because it touches on some core human and political and social issues. And I really hope you get to enjoy this movie again with all this knowledge and if you find something interesting please feel free to share with us about star trek to the wrath of khan yes this conversation does not have to end so with that let's move on to our final thoughts Thanks for sticking out the entire topic on the Wrath of Khan. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. Now it's time for our final thoughts, and I'm going to be running it this time around. So I guess my biggest thing is is talking about the needs of the many versus the needs of the few. And I think about the great causes of this world. Um, you know, we we talked earlier about the Indian farmers going to Mumbai to say what they need and what they want. We've seen young people in huge numbers on the date of recording walking out of their schools and and demanding better and more rational gun laws. We see groups of people taking to the streets to protect water. We see people going out and en masse and working to help those who we share a society with, who we share a world with, who sometimes we just share a city with, or maybe even a starship. And I see Spock's sacrifice as that action. He he represents what is really important here. And it is the collective versus the individual in a lot of cases. And I think within a collective, an individual can show their uniqueness and their personal amazingness. I mean, think about Spock in the original series. Think about Spock in the motion picture. And then, of course, think about Spock when he comes back in the next movie that we are going to be talking about the Politrex of. But Spock's actions, I think, speak so loud and they resonate. And though it must have been a shocker, and I hear that people don't really didn't really like the death of Spock originally when it had happened, there was a lot of like, what? That's no good. I guess to some degree, it was important that that's how that movie ended. Because what was it before that? It was Kirk and it was Khan and it was their egos doing battle with one another. It was it was their interests which were getting the upper hand on the other. And in that moment of victory, the final blow, like a matador killing a bull, the bull manages to get its horn into the matador, killing, pro- probably killing him, right? The Enterprise was about to be destroyed. And Khan was going to get his revenge anyway, even if it meant his own death. And Spock went and he readjusted that core and was able to save the entire ship. That action is beyond the pale in terms of what humanity can do. And of course, that's what Kirk says about Spock after he's gone. He says that he is the most human soul he has ever encountered. And I think that's very important because that's a message to us is where do we see the needs of the many outweighing the needs of the few? And I think that's maybe 
a way we can walk back some of the rhetoric that's taking place online and all of those things. What's important to you is important, absolutely. Food on your table, a roof over your head, loved ones and friends, and things that interest you, 100%. But I think also, what ways can you be helping the needs of the many? Are there things that you can do in your life, in your time? This isn't uh, anything huge, but... um, even just listening to someone, maybe at your work or on the bus or anywhere, can sometimes make a huge difference. And that's you giving to the needs of the many. So those are my final thoughts, Shashank. Any any final thoughts on my final thoughts? They were great. I always love listening to your final thoughts. And just to cap your thoughts, I would love if everyone listening reached out to us and told us what they thought of the Wrath of Khan, how they enjoyed it, what some of their favorite moments are. As I've made it abundantly clear on this recording, it's one of my favorite movies. So if you want to reach out to us and tell us what you thought of it, what you like, what you don't like about the Wrath of Khan, talk to us on at Polytrex on Twitter, reach out to us on Facebook on Polytrex. How else can people reach out to us just as a reminder, Barry? Well, you can leave us a message again, 609-512-LLAP. That's 609-512-5527. Of course, there are so many other shows to listen to here on the Tricorder Transmissions Network, so do give them a listen. But if you are still hankering for some more Trek, you can always check out Dan and Bill at the Trek Geeks. They're always loads of fun as well. So I think that'll do it. What do you say, Shashank? With that, live long and prosper. And onward to our star society.